Uh, I'm Swift. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, what I call Saturday morning breakfast cereal, uh, aka learning to hack on uh, Arduino in Python. So uh, I know it's not Saturday, it's actually Sunday, but I was trying to be witty. So. Uh, so if you've ever seen me talk before, this is the obligatory slide where I say that despite the handsome resemblance, I am in fact not Ryan Gosling, I am actually Swift. Uh, I am these days calling myself a free agent evangelist, which means that uh, I was a developer evangelist for a very long time and I recently retired to work on my own projects. Uh, I'm also one of the founders of Hacker League, which is a platform for people who organize and attend hackathons. So if you've ever been to a hackathon, there's a pretty high likelihood that you have used my software before. Uh, so, important thing to note, Twitter handle up top, if you want to comment while this is going on, feel free to do it, it's Swift Alpha one So let's talk about Arduino, that's what we're here to talk to you about today. Um, who knows what an Arduino is? Hands up. Cool. Everybody. Alright. How many people have one already? Alright, cool. Keep the hands up if you have one. How many people have made something cool with that Arduino already? So, <laughs> okay. Alright. Uh, so, a lot of people know about Arduino, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, all of you know what it is, but it's a little microcontroller that lets us talk to different hardware components. So think buttons, LEDs, sensors, whatever the real world, right? Uh, one of my favorite metaphors to use for this uh, is imagine you're an artist and your entire life you've been painting with like watercolor or oil paint or whatever. Uh, and one day somebody comes along and says, hey, this is clay. And you're like, oh my God, I can do like things with my hands and they could be 3D and it's like incredible. Uh, so that's like what Arduino is, right? Like this is our, our way of programmatically talking to the real world around us. Uh, so right now Arduino is kind of like this new hotness with developers and there will be no shortage of breakfast cereal characters in this presentation, I assure you. Uh, that's the Cocoa Puffs guy in case you didn't know. But uh, everybody loves Arduino. Uh, like I said, I, I run a company that's about hackathons, so I get to go to a lot of these things. And I've been noticing a trend where developers are making like really awesome hardware projects, uh, and there, a lot of them are using Arduino, and I got, really got to thinking about like why people are using Arduino. So I want to kind of outline uh, a lot of the reasons that people love Arduino and why it's the new hotness with developers right now. Uh, the big thing is that it's a really simple API. Uh, it's, it's just a microcontroller, so it's not like something like a Raspberry Pi uh, or a Beagle board that you might be familiar with, which are actually fully fledged computers. This is like literally just the microcontroller, uh, and the big thing is making it really easy for us to interact with these things. So like any of those other computers, the Raspberry Pi has digital pins, uh, that can manipulate things like LEDs or buttons, it's just not as easy to do with a Raspberry Pi as it is to do with an Arduino. So simplicity is really the key here. Uh, and the, the microcontroller underneath the Arduino, it's that, especially the Uno, is the AT Mega. Uh, and we'll kind of look at a diagram that shows like parts of an Arduino, Arduino uh, but like, that's just the thing that's running it. So it's really simple to use. Uh, it's built on open source, right? Uh, so Arduino itself, the hardware, is actually open source. That's why we see so many of these clones and DIY projects where people are making their own Arduino for even cheaper than uh, the ones you can buy off the shelf. Uh, the software, the language, the examples, everything is open source. You can go to GitHub and actually edit it and fork it and make your changes and contrib contribute it back to everybody else. So the entire platform is completely open source. And a lot of things that we're making and contributing to the world are also open source. So it's a big community of open source people. Uh, it's cheap, right? Like these things will cost, an Arduino out of the store will cost you less than $30. A lot of the time you can actually get them for free by going to, to hardware events. People will just give them out because they're so cheap. You can make your own for less than $5 now. So really cheap, really accessible. The sensors, components, things like that, they can be under a dollar. You know, there's some really high end stuff that you can buy, but for the most part, sensors are really super cheap. Um, and the best thing about them being cheap is they're available everywhere. So there's a Radio Shack right down the street that I went to yesterday or two days ago and bought an Arduino at, right? So in your local town, there is a store that sells Arduino. And if there's not one, which is very unlikely, you can buy them online readily available on Amazon or any of the other Arduino distributors. Uh, all this stuff is just available anywhere. Whenever I'm traveling, I always like to go to the local Radio Shack, raid the hardware components drawer, pick up some new sensors, buttons, switches, whatever. So it's definitely everywhere. Uh, this is the ugliest slide you'll see in this deck. It's the only one I couldn't figure out to put up here, but there are a ton of examples for Arduino. Go to Google, go to Arduino CC, go to Adafruit, go to SparkFun, go to GitHub. There are tons of examples out there, lots of sample code. People love to share the hardware hacks that they're building. Really easy to find new stuff to make. So Arduino is great. We all know it. That's really awesome. Um, 
So you probably wouldn't be here if you didn't really agree with that. But my goal is that everyone in this room at the end of this presentation will be able to leave, go to Radio Shack, buy an Arduino, and then hack on it and make something cool. So the next part we're actually going to do is we're going to go through an Arduino 101 in like lightning speed so that you all know how to do the basics of it. And then we're going to do some more cool stuff with Python. But this next bit is actually using the main Arduino language. So let's take a look at what an Arduino is composed of. Uh, I've highlighted the really important pieces that we're going to be using today. There's also the microcontroller, which I didn't highlight, which is this piece right here. So if you look at, at number one, that's the USB serial port, hence the name breakfast serial. Uh, it's just a way to, to send information from your computer to the board. Um, there are other ways of doing that, like XP is a protocol that makes it easy to do that kind of stuff over Wi-Fi, but really what we're, we're interested in is USB serial. Uh, the ground and power pins. So each of these little holes in the Arduino is a pin. Uh, you can put a wire in there, or multiple wires, I guess, if you really wanted to. But you pretty much for one wire only. Uh, the number two, the important pins there are ground and power. We're going to be using them. Uh, power is just obviously power. Ground is where uh, like the, it grounds. So uh, if you know, don't know anything about a circuit, a circuit starts at one end. It comes from power, and it goes to ground. So it has to be a complete circle from ground to power to actually go on. Um, three, digital pins. So digital pins, uh, let's talk about like what digital versus analog. Digital is like a one or a zero. So it's either on or off, uh, high or low in our case. Uh, so versus analog, which can be anywhere on a scale of zero to 255, right? So uh, this is like one and zero versus some kind of scale where there can be multiple options. So digital pins are up top. There's 13 of them uh, on our Arduino Uno. Analog pins are down here on the bottom. There are six of them, uh, and we're going to use both of those today. So that's like a really basic, what, what is this Arduino thing? Um, so let's actually do Hello World, right? Uh, and if you were in any of the other hardware talks today, uh, yesterday in Lightning Talks, then you know that Hello World is to make an LED blink. So I'm going to go ahead and start by plugging in my Arduino to the computer here so that we actually can do something with it. Uh, okay, so now it's plugged in. So the first step for Hello World is to download the Arduino IDE. Uh, I've already done this step, but you can get it on arduino.cc. So really easy. Uh, basically, there's a couple things you want to know about the, the IDE. There's these two buttons here, which are verify and upload. Verify compiles the sketch that you're, you've written. It's actually written in like a C-like -like language. Uh, it's proprietary Arduino language. It's kind of uh, processing C mashup with some Arduino APIs in there. Um, and then, so you write some code in this IDE, you verify that it compiles, and then you upload it to your board using the IDE. Uh, and the next thing we need to do is wire up a LED, so or an LED, depending on how you want to call it. Lucky for us, uh, the Arduino has a, pin, a digital pin 13 and a ground right next to it, so we can literally just stick an LED the long side into the, the 13 pin, the short side into the ground, uh, and we have a complete circuit. And if you look at this diagram, there's a resistor. It's really not needed. I've already blown out a couple of LEDs doing this, but it's really not that risky, and they cost less than a uh, dollar each, so it's really not a huge deal. Uh, and then in order to, and going back to our complete circuit, one end is in power, a digital pin, and one end goes to ground, so a full circuit. Uh, so then the code for that to actually make it run is this. So we initialize a variable called LED, which has the value 13, which is the number of pin that it corresponds to. We tell the Arduino in setup that the pin is an output, some, something that we send data or change the, the power to. Uh, and then we start by writing it as high, which means the LED comes on. We delay for one second. We write it as low, which means the LED turns off. We wait for one second and repeat. So setup runs once when the board is first connected and initialized. Loop runs continuously the entire life of the program. So let's actually do this. So in the, this is just like really impossible to see and I totally apologize, but this is exactly the code that I showed you on the board or on the slide before. So if we take this and we, we're just gonna go straight to uploading, it's gonna compile, it uploads to our board and then I'm gonna hold it up here while it blinks every one second, right? So we just did Hello World with Arduino. It's totally super simple, nothing crazy. This is actually in, if you go up here, there's like this examples folder. It's got tons of stuff that we're going to be using. Uh, the, the basic LED blank is right in there too. So uh, that, that's the code to do it. Um, so I can just kind of imagine the Tricks Rabbit coming in here and being like, hey, kids, like prototyping in C is fun and awesome. You should totally do it. And the kids are always smarter than the rabbit, and they're like, 
dude, are you kidding me? Like, who wants to write in C and who wants to like prototype in that stuff? I already know my own language. Like, we use Python. Uh, so, friends don't let friends program in C. We're gonna like, go back to our roots here. Uh, there's a couple of, of, of problems that I hear uh, when people are building stuff with Arduino, right? They get through Hello World and they're like, I want to make something cool now. Uh, so they ask me a bunch of questions, uh, things like this, like how do I talk to the internet, right? Like I have this board and I have these sensors and they're reading data and doing things. And they're like, man, I wanted to like tell the world about this or like display it in like some interface in the web. Uh, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, Arduino, like there's no internet connection on the board, but we can do like an ethernet shield and then we can like talk over ethernet to it. They're like, oh, cool, like, where do I get an Ethernet shield? And they go to Radio Shack and they buy one. It's like 30 bucks or 40 bucks. And they're like, okay, yeah, get the shield. It costs as much as the board. Plug it in, and then we hook up our Ethernet. And Arduino gives us this Ethernet library. Uh, and then we end up with code like this, right? Uh, this, is, this is what it takes to create a post request using the Ethernet library. Uh, you can literally see that we're implementing post over HTTP there. We're actually writing that directly to the client. Uh, and I'm like, lol, are you kidding me? Like, who implements post requests like by hand? Uh, nobody's got time for that. So uh, there's too much error, for, room for error. It's really hard to debug these things. You have to record things like MAC address and like worry about that stuff. And I'm like, why? I don't have time for this. Uh, another thing that they run into really quickly is it's limited horsepower. Like this board can only ho hold so much memory. It has a little bit of onboard memory, but it's not a lot. Anytime you want to like do something that, that's complicated or store data or anything like that, or do complex processing, like you have to take it off the board no matter what. So either you're going to do it connected to the computer over serial, which is what we're going to be doing, or you can do it over Ethernet or Wi-Fi. Uh, but regardless, like the board itself can, is great for like reading and writing and like just input output stuff, but it's really not great for computing. Uh, so we need a way to like record the data and send it away to do something with it. So I'm like, man. There's got to be a better way, right? Like I'm, I'm a developer, I'm a hacker, I'm like building stuff. I don't want to write in C. I want to be able to do all these things really easily. Uh, there's got to be like some kind of alternative to this. So here's my ideal checklist for what it would take uh, to actually uh, go out and like find something that would, would work for this. So in an ideal world, it's language agnostic, right? So I want to be able to write in my own language, whether that be Python, JavaScript, Ruby, whatever. Um, I want to be cross-platform. So, and when I say that, I mean I want it to run on, on anybody's computer. It doesn't matter who you are. I want you to be able to take out your laptops right now and run this stuff. Um, it has to be able to talk to the internet. Like, that's a, a fundamental part of like our hacking culture today is that we make things that talk to each other on the internet. So I want to be able to expose the data to the internet. Uh, and I want to be able to do complex processing easily. And complex processing could be anything from like storing data to actually manipulating it or whatever or displaying it but do that processing easily. Uh, and I also, in addition to these things, I want to keep all of those main value propositions that I showed you earlier, right? Like a cheap, available, simple, open source, lots of examples. Like, so let's keep all the basic stuff and add on these like four main things that we really want. Uh, and so I did what the developer thing is and I followed my nose as Toucan Sam would be very proud to hear. Um, so I ended up running into this thing called Fermata. So Fermata you can think of as like an API for talking to microcontrollers over serial. So you take a program uh, that's Pramata, it's open source, it's just a protocol that, that people implement in different languages, uh, you upload it to your Arduino board, and now we can communicate with this Arduino over serial by sending a series of bytes and it knows what to do. Uh, and I'm actually gonna like do some really cool stuff here and like show you how this works under the hood, hopefully, but um, the really cool thing is that Fermata is actually distributed with the Arduino IDE. So we're actually gonna go through doing that right now so if I open up the IDE and I go to, let's see, where am I? File, examples, Fermata, and then I go to the standard Fermata, I can click that and it's gonna open up this window over here. Uh, so I have it open already. I'm just gonna upload this directly to our board. Uh, you can actually just go through this code and look at it. It's pretty straightforward. It, it, basically what's happening is there's like a handshake when you initially connect to the board and then it will we'll send information like, okay, we want to turn on digital pin 13 and we want to put it in output mode and we want to send it this information. So it's like 13, the number uh, one to say it's on and then the number of one to say it's reporting and then it'll come back and we'll be able to do it. So this is implemented on Pi Serial. So we're actually going to like do this real quick, hopefully. But let's open up a Python REPL. Um, so we're going to import serial. Oh, hang on. We're not going to do that. We're going to, forgot to source the virtual environment. Cool. Now we're going to do that. All right. So we're going to import serial. Uh, and then we're going to do like 
serial equals serial dot serial. Uh, and so we have to give it a port. So it's actually like, I know what mine is, but um, it could be anything. You'd kind of have to look it up. Uh, USB modem 1411. Uh, and this next bit is like a baud rate, which is just like how many uh, requests per second are going over serial. So we now have our serial connection. We're going to do like serial is open. How often are you going to go to a talk and somebody's going to be like doing protocol stuff on the terminal in front of you? That's fucking awesome. Um, so let's see if we have some bytes in waiting now that we're doing the handshake. Um, so we have some bytes. Okay, so let's like read the first one. Uh, okay, so it's like E. Or we can read the next one. So these are like different things, right? Like, so the next one, F9, I know off the top of my head. We can look at it in a browser real quick. But like, if we go to this protocol and we see like, uh, where's F9? F9 is here. So it's like protocol version. And then we can get the next two. It's major, minor. So we'll be like, all right, let's read the next one. It's 2.3. Like, all right, whatever. And we can go through this and actually read this protocol and send it data and like do this over the wire uh, using PySerial, which is great. But this is kind of like tedious and by hand and like, okay, it meets that cross platform thing, but we lose like ease and accessibility. So uh, there must be like a better option. So, which there is, and I'll show you. So this is back to our slides. Oop, it didn't go. Uh, you go back. There we go, cool. Sorry. All right, back to our slides. So, uh, there's actually a great library called PyFormata. Uh, it's made by this guy Tino. Uh, so it's on GitHub. You can kind of go look at it. But this is that same example, Hello World, that we looked at before in Arduino, except this time it's in Python, which is great. So uh, basically, we import PyFormata. We import Sleep. We connect to our Arduino board, which we know is on USB modem 1411, just because that's my computer. Maybe it's different on yours, but we have to kind of look that up. We say board, like we know you have bit digital pins on 13, and then forever while right hide, wait one second, right low, wait one second, right? So we can run this exact same program, and it would produce that same exact blank that we had before. Uh, I still think we can do better. This is a little bit complicated. We need to do things like look up uh, like what our, our actual serial port is. We need to like know the difference between like writing a one versus writing a zero. We need to know digital pins versus analog pins. Like there's a lot of complicated stuff here that kind of sucks. Uh, so I think we can do better. So I kind of went looking. In JavaScript and Ruby, there's actually really good libraries to do this stuff already. Uh, so where I started was in JavaScript with Johnny5. Uh, and then this new this Ruby one is like post Johnny5, post breakfast serial. It kind of came out. But it's like an unified wrapper. But they're doing the same thing, right? Like they give you these objects that make it really easy to interact uh, with like the Arduino stuff without having to know any of the underlying protocol or anything like that, right? Or how it works. So you can just kind of plug it in and go. Uh, so I was teaching all these workshops. I was teaching, uh, I did the, the Arduino workshop at Heroku's conference was, uh, I did uh, a couple other like smaller conferences around. Uh, and so most of the time when I was doing these things, I was teaching the JavaScript and Ruby stuff. And nobody really ever asked about Python for whatever reason. Uh, they did, I was just like, oh, I don't really know. There must be a library out there that does it. So uh, I got asked to do the workshop at PyCon uh, back in March. And so I was on my way to PyCon coming from South by Southwest. And I'm like, oh, yeah, let me just look up what the library is. It's like Johnny Five or whatever. I look it up. And I already agreed to do this workshop. And I'm like, oh, my God, there's no library. Like, what am I going to do? I got to teach this workshop. So on the plane between South by Southwest and PyCon, I wrote breakfast cereal, uh, which... <laughs> I then proceeded to go to this workshop and teach uh, a room of 100 developers how to use, and I'd live debugged it on the spot in the room uh, and was patching bugs like during the, the actual workshop, which was amazing. It was a, like, a really great experience, but uh, it totally worked. And then uh, I've been adding new components ever since, so we ended up with uh, Breakfast Cereal, which you can find on GitHub slash they call me Swift slash Breakfast Cereal. Um, it's essentially a really simple wrapper for these things that we've been looking at. It's built on PyFormata and PySerial. Um, I take care of all the logic and give you some common patterns to use so that you don't have to worry about implementing that stuff yourself. Uh, you can just get right to hardware hacking with Arduino. Uh, so it's available on PyPy, pip install breakfast cereal, super ex it's simple. Um, we're going to look at that uh, hello world that we did again before. So this is it. It's even simpler. So from breakfast cereal, we're just going to import these simple objects, Arduino, LED. We're going to connect to the board. No worrying about what serial port it's on. It's just going to auto find it. And then we're going to sell it. There's a, that, there's a LED on that board on pin 13. And then we're just going to tell that LED to blink. So like we can actually do this live. 
uh, let's go back to the terminal. We're just going to open up a Python REPL. Uh, and so like from breakfast, cereal, import, Arduino, and lead. Uh, we'll do like, we'll create a new board equals an Arduino. Uh, and then when that connects, it see it automatically discover the port. You can pass in one if you're, so right now this is supports uh, window, or start this supports Mac and Linux. Uh, to support Windows, all you have to do is figure out the port yourself. Like, I'm not auto-discovering for Windows. So if you have a Windows machine, you can do this stuff, too. You just have to look up your serial port in the Arduino IDE, which you can do. And I'll show you at the end if you want to hear about that. Uh, and then so we just create a LED, which is just a LED on the board. And then it's on pin 13. And uh, we could do something like LED dot on. Okay, and so now the LED's on, right? And we wrote this entirely in Python. It's only three lines so far. Uh, the LED is on. And... We're, like we've probably met a lot of those criteria. We'll go back and look at it. But like, so lead is not the only thing we can do too. So we could do like from breakfast cereal uh, import like button. So then we could do something like button is another button object. It's on that board uh, and it's on pin eight this time. And then we could do something like button dot down LED dot toggle. Right, and now when I press the button, the LED toggles, right? And so now we've written a light switch in five lines of Python, right? Uh, which is pretty cool. So I think that's, that's awesome. Uh, but like, that was like the basics of what we did in the, the workshop. And since then, we've added a ton of other stuff. And I'm going to show you some examples uh, of like what exactly um, we've done. But I have to show you this slide next to like do that oh, because uh, I've spent a lot of time working on this, and it's awesome. I promise these slides are beautiful. There we go. Cool. So I totally took the GitHub, <laughs> open GitHub time, and then replaced the words. Look at that. Look how good. So <laughs> now that we've seen that masterpiece, let's go back to the demos. <laughs> OK, cool. So I have with me a couple of demos. I just did the light switch for you. We're going to come back to that one in a second. Uh, I'm just going to switch out my board here to a different one. So OK. So on this board that I have here, I've got some different stuff wired up. Uh, so let's look at the first one, which is a light sensor. So if I run Python and we just import breakfast cereal again, cereal import. So just like a button and an LED, we could just pull in like a sensor. Uh, and then we could do something like, we have to create our board object again, obviously. Uh, but oop, our Oh, I forgot to import Arduino. Cool. So now we just create our board, it connects, which it's doing, and then we can create like a, like a light sensor. So light equals, it's a sensor, uh, and it's on board, and this one is on. So this is where we're going to switch over to those analog pins that I was talking about. So analog, we can read multiple values. It's not just one or zero. It's anywhere in between. Uh, so we can do like, this is on A1 in this case, uh, and then we can do like, let's make a print value function, so print value. And we could, at any point, we could just do like, light, uh, print light dot value, right? And it's like gonna tell us the value of like the light bulb right there, so if I take out my phone and I have a flashlight app on it, which I do, so like I open up the flashlight and like now I just like kind of hold this and run the same code. Like, you'll see it's changing, right? Like, the more light it is, the closer it gets to zero. So uh, we can, like, kind of iterate over that and do something like def print value or print val. Uh, and then oops. and then we could do something like print uh, light dot value. And then we'll do, like, light dot change. So whenever the light changes, uh, then we'll just do, like, print val. Cool. And so now, when we pull up our flashlight app, we can like watch this stuff in real time. Whoa. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but we can do even more cool stuff than that. So I have a potentiometer as well. So we can like hand code this, but I'll just kind of show it to you. So the same idea, create the board, connect to the potentiometer, which is like a little knob. Uh, it's on uh, A0. We have a LED that's there. This is this big red guy that we're going to be using for a couple of these demos. 
uh, which whenever the sensor changes, we're going to change the brightness of the LED. So before we saw either on or off, but you could also set brightness levels with this thing called PWM, which is essentially uh, you're sending signals repeatedly at a certain interval to, uh, to an object on a digital pin so that it kind of imitates that whole analog situation that you can run into. So like if we uh, run this, so let's do like Python uh, uh, potentiometer. So it'll connect, and then when that goes, we can like actually spin this little knob, and you guys can all kind of see that this LED is slowly getting brighter the more I spin it, and then I can go back down to, uh, but it's really just pretty simple stuff, right? Like this is just a binding between, like there's a callback function that gets called whenever some kind of event is happening on the board, uh, which is a pretty common pattern for like something like JavaScript, but probably isn't too familiar necessarily for like a lot of Python libraries, unless you're doing a lot of evented programming. Uh, so that one's pretty cool, but I think we could do even better than that. So I'm going to swap out my Arduinos another time here. Now this one I'm just going to pull up here because it's kind of hands-on. So with this one, if, uh, plug that guy in. Cool. So this one, uh, I made a keyboard. So essentially the way this works is only work on a Mac if you're going to check out this code. But uh, essentially I have five buttons on the, a board, each one maps to a different like uh, musical note. So, oop. so if we actually run this keyboard and then it'll start up and now we can like do some kind of fun. Oh, there's no audio. So now we can do. So that's kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of an idea of some of the stuff you could do, but like, all right, what about that internet thing we talked about before? Like maybe I want to talk to the internet. So I also have an example for this one. Anybody got a cell phone on them? Get it out. We're going to need it. Uh, so, okay. So we're going back to the LED over here. Uh, basically I made like a call waiting thing using Twilio. So if we look at the server, it's a really simple flask server. Uh, basically what happens is there's this caller and there's an agent, a caller calls in, they get queued up for an agent to call them back. Uh, really simple stuff. And then I have a client here for the Arduino that basically, uh, when you, it'll, when there's a, somebody waiting in the queue, the light will come on when there's not, it'll be off. So, uh, like if we actually just run the, I got to connect to the internet. Sorry. Let's make sure we're connected. Cool. And then. Let's just verify. Cool. All right. So, oh, yeah, good. All right. So if we now run that, so Python, uh, color ID, Arduino. Cool. So it'll start up. That should be connected to the right one. Oh, no. Why is my environment? Oh, my environment's screwed up. Oh, no, what happened? Oh. Okay, we're back. So let's try that again. What happened? Source credentials. Okay. Try that one more time. Cool. All right. So somebody want to call in that number? And I'll be the agent, and we can hear me us talking back and forth. So hopefully, if this goes through, someone will call, or I'll call. What is it, 624, yeah. So I'm calling, which hopefully will go through. An no. Yeah, all right, well, it doesn't look like this one's gonna work for whatever reason. Twilio is not behaving properly for me. Um, oh, I know because I deployed it to GitHub. Oh, okay, here's we're gonna do some like, or I deployed it to Heroku. We're gonna do some. All right, actually, we're not even gonna do that. We're just gonna go. All right, so that would be a demo of talking to the internet if it had worked. But we can kind of try again at the end if people are interested in that. Um, so like, let's move on a little bit. Uh, okay, so we did the demo. We did a couple of them. Uh, so let's go back and revisit that feature wish list that we started with. Uh, so language agnostic, cross-platform, talks to the internet, solves complex processing. Uh, 
I don't know. How do we feel about that? I think we did it. Yeah, I kind of feel like we did those things. Uh, so we don't have to, to worry about We can use Python. Like we know and love Python. We don't have to write anything in C. Uh, we don't have to worry about things like low, high digital analog whatever we just kind of know it it's there uh, we just build a circuit and then create these objects and go for it um, internet complex processing like that stuff is taken care of because it's written running our machine and it could already do that uh, so I say we pass all those things so I kind of want to spend the next couple of minutes talking about like some of the things that I learned from doing this um, so one of the big things when I was designing this is I wanted to, to make it really simple for developers to use. Like my goal is that anybody can just go download this library, walk through setting it up, and then it should be the API should come naturally, right? Like a lot of these things like PyFormata or some of these other Arduino libraries that are out there, like I kind of have to keep going back to the documentation to figure out what to do. I want this to feel really natural, and I think that's really important. And everything I've seen when I'm going to like hackathons and I'm talking to developers who are using this stuff, uh, one of the most important things is that if I add a new component, it needs to make sense. Like anybody should be able to just open the library, do from breakfast cereal import component X, and be able to do it. And it's really easy to implement these components. I actually implemented a couple of them last night. Um, really simple, right? Like you just extend a base component class and then add on whatever attributes you need. Or if it's an input, you inherit from a sensor class and then add on whatever attributes you need. Uh, so really simple stuff. Uh, and that, that's really important. Uh, I think actually one of the things that's kind of interesting about that whole process and like designing this library uh, is that the whole idea of like when we say API, we think RESTful API, like web. Uh, we kind of lost that idea of API design for like actual client libraries and for like general purpose libraries that we use. Uh, really, that stuff is important too. And I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that because. Uh, I've seen firsthand like the problems that people run into, and I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen when I was using my library. Uh, examples are everything too. Like that's another thing. So I have a couple of examples. Like if you go to, to GitHub.com, they call me Swift Breakfast Cereal, you'll, and there's an examples folder. Uh, you know, I did like a bunch of basic ones, right? Like I did a lot of the stuff that we just did now. Uh, I also did like some more advanced things. But there's like, examples. But the more examples you have, the better it is with this kind of stuff because people, developers, just want to be able to like have an idea, find something that kind of meets as close as they want to get to it and then modify it to use. Uh, they don't want to be like hand coding, going through docs, things like that. So uh, one of the things I'm really working on is adding more examples and whatever. But probably the most obvious lesson uh, that I learned, I'm going to tell you in joke form, but please don't storm the stage and kill me when I say this. Uh, I don't need to be murdered. But asynchronous IO in, in Python is a joke. Like I come from a JavaScript background where we get that stuff for free. And there's, you know, we don't get that in Python. There are libraries to do it, but none of them, a lot of them are geared towards like web asynchronous IO. So like, it'll be like a web server. And I'm like, I don't need a web server. I need like an event emitter class. And I don't want to have to worry about spinning up threads in the background. Like this stuff should come for free. And um, there's a lot of progress going on that, on that right now in Python. Um, uh, if you're interested, it's, it's PP3156. Uh, so, but that's only going to be for Python 3, and it's going to be this basic kind of event loop that's going to go into Python 3. But there's no plan to backport it to Python 2x, right? So, uh, which is kind of unfortunate because having a general purpose event emitter is really important when you want to do anything asynchronous, especially with I.O. Uh, and like, I basically ended up implementing my own in breakfast cereal. So if you go and you look under the hood in the code, and uh, we can kind of look at this, actually it's pretty interesting. Basically I implemented this basic event emitter class that has like basic bindings uh, and then calls callbacks as needed. But like I was implementing that myself and then I, in order to actually handle each Arduino, I have to spin up a separate monitoring thread to like monitor it for bytes and like handle actually delegating that to the event emitter. Uh, but if I had a single event loop, it would make a lot more sense to like put this stuff in and just run it on an event loop rather than have to worry about like a thread and monitoring and then doing all these event emitter stuff. It's kind of ridiculous. So one thing I really want to improve, and if I can like get some time to work on this, what my big goal for breakfast cereal is to implement some kind of base event loop in Python two seven uh, that people can just use and then base breakfast cereal on that. So that's like a big goal for mine. Another thing that. I'd, Kind of, I put together this rhyme. It kind of reminds me of the Lucky Charms rhyme, but it's buttons, LEDs, and sensors, servos, buzzers, too, lots of new components added by devs like you. So it's really simple to add this stuff. It's all open source. Anybody can go out there and just kind of add the things. Uh, I only use a, a, like a pretty small set of components, right? I'm teaching workshops. So these people have never used Arduino before. These are like really basic things. 
Uh, so I can add that stuff that like comes into these workshops. It's really simple. I can, I have the components. I do it all the time. Like it's super simple for me to add that when things become more advanced, like I'm not always out there doing that. So I need developers out there to start adding these things. Uh, so like servo, for example, like I don't normally use servos too much, but somebody in the community contributed like a servo class to this, which is really awesome. Right. So these things that I'm not using every day, like that's what I, my call to action is like, you want to help out, you want to do this cool stuff. Like it's super simple to add these things. Like we're going to walk through, uh, what the component class looks like. Uh, so it's really simple. I'll kind of give you that. And so my, my joke here is seriously though, I'm accepting pulls. So, um, so that's kind of like the, the gist of like all of my, uh, like main content. If you want more and you're like really interested in this stuff, uh, there's a couple of things that I'm like putting together. Uh, you're going to, this talk is like really in its infancy. This is the first time I've ever given it. I'm going to be giving it again at PyCon Canada at uh, robots Conf and Makerland in different formats. Uh, and so if you're interested in like breakfast cereal specifically, like look for those things, uh, more sp generally to Arduino, I actually own the domain Arduino.io. I have no idea why that was available, but I just purchased it. Uh, it's going to be a place where, uh, like you can find events for hardware hacking and Arduino. So right now there's a landing page. It's nothing up there yet. I haven't had time to like actually build out the site. It's getting there. But uh, if you go to Arduino.io, you can like sign up to like find out when it launches. Uh, and basically, you'll be able to find Arduino and hardware hacking events near you uh, as they're happening, right? So that's Arduino.io. If you are in New York or you know people in New York, I'm running these intro to Arduino workshops. You guys just got a really simple crash course on how to do Arduino stuff, so you probably don't need this. But if you have friends who are interested in learning Arduino, uh, I'm teaching two workshops, one in September, or one in August, one in September in New York City. So if people are interested, uh, they can definitely find out about that. It's going to be announced with the launch of Arduino IO. So check that out. Um, before I get to the last slide, I kind of want to go and look at that uh, component class, which we can do. Uh, I want this. Yeah. So let's go to my open source directory. Cool. So like if the basic structure of this is in breakfast cereal components, uh, we have this really basic component class, which is just inherits from an event emitter. Uh, you can see that like essentially what happens is you assign a board to the, the actual uh, object and then either we're getting an analog or a digital pin uh, and then we have a value, right? Which is like the value of that sensor and all that stuff is implemented for you. And then when you want to actually implement something, like if we go down here to lead, right? Like basically all I did was add is on, which is either true or false, uh, and an interval that it, it blinks at if I'm doing a, a kind of a blink example, uh, and then implement the basic methods, right? So on, off, write one, write zero. And it's just like a simple abstraction on top of that stuff. Uh, and then adding intervals and toggling is, you know, there as well and setting the brightness. But like this stuff is really simple to extend and add. So if you have a component that you really want to use, uh, it's really not intimidating to just come in here and add that stuff. Um, so now that we've looked at that, now that we've seen some examples, um, I'm just going to do my last slide here, which is, uh, oop, not that it is, sorry, Mavericks. Uh, there we go. Cool. So play that. So it's thank you. I'm Swift, Twitter, Swift Alpha One. You can read more about the kind of stuff I'm working on besides breakfast cereal. And in addition to breakfast cereal at my website, they call me Swift.com. Uh, so let's open it up to questions if people have them. So the question is, I've spent some time with async. Have I tried like Twisted or any of those other things? Yeah. So I have tried uh, a lot of different asynchronous libraries. Uh, basically, what I'm looking for is the lowest common denominator. I don't necessarily need all of the advanced uh, things that come in with something like Twisted or Tornado or whatever, right? Like all these different, or whatever, any of the other ones, right? Like I've seen some that are like simpler than others. Uh, the big thing I really want is just a dead simple event loop. And if it can conform to the, the standard that's being implemented in Python 3, like that would be great. Uh, that's kind of my goal. And like if you look at that spec, it's like super bare bones. Like there's no extra help involved. And that's like really what I need. And I don't need any extra baggage coming along with this. Like I really want, there's a, the dependencies on Py Formata and Py Serial kind of suck because I have to have them, but the less dependencies I have when I'm doing this, the better and, and the smaller they are. So, yep. Yeah, you talked about API design. Um, can you talk about why you had like LED on daisy chain itself? Because I know it didn't happen. I think it was buttoned up down. Yep. Uh, so the, 
the question is like I talk a lot about API design and why it's important to me. Uh, some methods are daisy chainable, some are not. Uh, the the daisy chaining for LED on actually is a legacy thing, which I'm going to bring be bringing back prior to the 010 launch. Uh, essentially, I want to build some methods into component for waiting. So, like, say you wanted to do something like when we were implementing that call queue with Twilio, which didn't work, unfortunately, but if it had worked, say we wanted to like have the light blink out the number of people who are waiting in the queue, really simple would be like to, you know, LED on dot wait one dot on whatever or off whatever, and be able to chain that stuff together uh, with the button down that what you're doing there is like actually binding to a callback. You're not actually, I mean, you could, I guess I could daisy chain that stuff. I, I really never thought about that, but that would be, that would make sense to do too. Um, but yeah, so basically the daisy chaining is going to be important when I implement these extra, like essentially they're patterns that people use all the time, like waiting one second or doing something on interval or whatever. Um, so I kind of, if you're familiar with jQuery at all, where they do being able to go into a context and then back out of a context as well. Like that's kind of what I'm going for eventually. Yep. So the question is, I was saying like lead and I was assigning it to a board and a number. And the question is why was I doing that? Right. Is that, To, okay, the question is why doesn't board have methods to bind uh, objects to the board? When I was doing it, uh, I was actually working with three Arduinos attached to my computer at once. So I wanted to be able to generate these objects and then bind them dynamically to the whatever board I happen to be talking about or an array of boards uh, that were, were all like had different components. So it was just when I designed it, that was the way that made the most sense. Uh, there could be something like board attach and then pass it like an object and like that would work too. Uh, I never implemented that because I have like a purpose for it, but um, it's also extra code, right? So which is like something I'm, one of the things that I really stressed was that I wanted to reduce the amount of code that somebody had to write. So like if you had an attach method, it would be something like from breakfast cereal import Arduino lead button board equals Arduino lead equals lead on lead 13 button equals button eight, button dot down, LED dot hoggle. And then at the bottom, now we have to also have board dot attach button, board dot attach lead, whatever. So now we're adding these extra complexity in where people have to remember to attach. Uh, I could make it an optional dependency like that. That actually might make sense. Um, my, my original goal was like reducing code uh, and the pattern that I came up with was like that. So, but yeah, I mean like, if you think there's a better pattern for anything I'm doing, then please like fork and do it and let's talk. Like I'm definitely open. It's in very early stage. Like right now we're at 008. Uh, and my goal is to have like the API definitely simplified before we hit 010. So other questions? Good. The question is, like, this is really great for prototyping, but it has to be attached to a computer. Is there anything that I can do where I can upload it and then not attach it to a computer? Uh, so for what I'm doing with, with serial communication, it has to be attached to something that can do, that can run Python and run whatever language you're running and then do the interpretation over serial. Uh, if you want to compile things and put them on computer, you can write it in C or Arduino proprietary language, uh, those actually compile down and actually are on the board. And so in addition to being power, powerable by serial, you can power these things through a five or not, uh, I don't remember how many volts input it is. Uh, so like a battery or a wall socket or something like that uh, to compile it down. Uh, one of the big complaints people have is like, oh, I don't want to have it attached to this clunky computer. Like why can't I attach it to like something smaller? Uh, so that's actually what really nice about like a Raspberry Pi is like, also pretty small. So like on the back of this Arduino, I could like literally like tape a Raspberry Pi back here and like, you know, run the serial and it would work. Like that would actually solve the problem. Um, so like the goal is, is mostly for prototyping. I have people come to me like when I tell them about this library and they're like, oh, this is really awesome. Like it's so cool. Uh, but I don't think it'll work for like my heart rate monitor. And I'm like, 
this is for prototyping. You don't don't use this on any life critical or mission critical stuff, please. Like, <laughs> that would be really bad. So, uh, and, and when you want to talk about things like, so, I, and this is going to go beyond the scope of your question. Like, the, the the simple answer is, if you want to use serial communication and use the libraries that I wrote, then it's only attached to a computer of some kind, whether that be your actual computer or Raspberry Pi. Uh, when you, like when you want to design mission critical software with microcontrollers which some people do, right? Like Arduino is generating this whole movement of people who are like building hardware things as startups. Uh, when you run a right mission critical software, you're better off, right, implementing it on the board and then doing the communication from the board itself if you can, just because it's going to be faster, right? Like think about the difference in time in like sending bytes over a, a serial communication and then interpreting them on each side versus like just running in that loop and doing as much processing as you can in that. Uh, you can get bigger microcontrollers. Like an Uno is a relatively small, has a small amount of memory. It's like a pretty fast processor in theory, but like you can get better, right? Like the newer Arduinos like are bigger and better and whatever, right? Like or have more ports or whatever you need. So like the beauty of it being open is that you can build whatever you need. Is there like an understood, like even just a documentation of translation between like I'm doing this with my serial. If I want to keep doing that, I do this kind of thing in serial. So... The question is, is there like some kind of direct mapping between what I'm doing in breakfast cereal and what I'm doing in C? Uh, there's not really, uh, there could be, right? Like uh, there's no, most of the time, like the, the audience I'm going after right now is like hackers and prototypers and people who want to build cool stuff just to like show off and like do something. Uh, so like this is going to be, like I have a build bot sitting in my room. Like essentially whenever anybody deploys code to Hacker League or, put, or adds a branch to GitHub and makes a pull request, I'm waiting for those and like pulling it down to my local machine, running the tests and flashing an LED and playing a sound based on what happens, uh, which can be really annoying at night. But like that's, it's going on, right? But it's attached to my computer because that's, it's for that, right? Like that's what I really was, like things that, that augment our experience as people and like play with that physical world around us is like what I'm going for. But there's no actual mapping between like what I'm doing and see, but there could be easily, like it wouldn't really be hard to translate. And in fact, I think there's probably actually a lot of value to something that would take any of those three libraries, Johnny Five, R2, Breakfast Serial, take what's happening and then actually can turn it into C code. Like that could be really cool. Um, and it could be cross platform too, but it doesn't exist right now. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the question is, have I run into any issues with Fermata and type conversion? Like, getting values out is what I expect. Uh, it's actually, Fermata itself isn't the issue. It's PyFermata, which is the issue that I've run into. So, a classic example is something like a button versus an analog sensor. So, they're both sensors of some kind. A button either returns, like, I'm down or I'm not. It's on or off. Uh, whereas an analog sensor can return any floating value in between. So, like it'll do some weird conversion where it turns it one into true and one into like 0.5, whatever, um, which is bad, but I'm like accounting for that in breakfast cereal. So I have run into like things like that that are really weird. And I'm like, man, I really hate this. But um, so like coming from a JavaScript background, when I use this stuff, like all the typing was dynamic. So like it was pretty easy to like figure that stuff out there. Uh, and like Python still has a lot of those same elements, just not as... It's, I think it's floating point. I don't, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. It could be good, like, one of my big complaints, and I really shouldn't complain because I didn't write the library and I haven't really contributed, so I can't, like, go, but Pi Vermata definitely needs some upgrading. Uh, there's a lot, there's a ton of better implementations out there in different languages, and, like, all you have to do is really copy what other people did and, like, pull it into your, into Pi Vermata. I just haven't had time to sit down and do a lot of that stuff. Uh, I plan on doing it when I have time. Like, I keep saying it when I have time, and, like, I'm a very busy person just like everybody else in this room. So like when I have time one day and you know, in fairy tale land, like that's where we go for. But uh yeah, there's definitely upgrades that can be made to Pi Fermata specifically. Fermata as a protocol is pretty pretty hardcore though. Like it's pretty solid. I don't think there's too many known like bugs and they get patched pretty quickly. So anybody else? All good. All right. Well thank you. My name is Swift. I'm Swift Alpha One on Twitter. Call me Swift. <laughs>